Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to the MIT Forum for Equity. I am Sujata Gupta, social sciences reporter at Science News and a 2018 MIT Night Science Journalism Fellow. I will be moderating, moderating today's webcast. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. As a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. Alumni joining us via Zoom can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar. We'll get to as many questions as possible. We have also invited alumni to share with us the ways you have been involved in this spring's movement to advance equity in your community. Feel free to share this in the chat as well. Our guest today is Dean Melissa Nobles. She is the Kenan Sahin Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences and Professor of Political Science at MIT. She will share some of her research today on ethnicity and politics, black lives, policing, human rights, criminal and restorative justice, and the census. We'll post her full bio in the chat now. Dean Nobles, please start by telling us your reactions to this spring and summer's events and how you're thinking about this year in light of your research. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. And good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to be a part of this most important um, conversation. So when I first heard about the events of the spring and particularly the killing of George Floyd and the killing before that of Breonna Taylor and before that, Ahmaud Arbery, I had the reaction that I imagine most of you had, which is of deep horror. I was deeply saddened, but also I had a sense of familiarity. And that familiarity came because uh, uh, the course of my research, I've uh, learned quite a bit about these kinds of killings. And indeed, once the, after George Floyd's uh, killing in particular, as the commentaries began uh, regarding uh, his death, there was often discussions about the deep historical roots of racial violence in the US. And they would typically go back to the slave patrols even of the antebellum period uh, of American history. Uh, but I thought actually we have much closer historical and, uh, 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 antecedents and those have to do with uh, racial violence in the Jim Crow South. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about today. Um, my current research, uh, which is done in collaboration with uh, the civil rights and restorative justice uh, Law Clinic at Northeastern Law School and my collaborator, Professor Margaret Burnham, uh, and, uh, and then connected a bit to the current uh, Black Lives uh, movement. And after that, I look forward to quite an interesting uh, conversation and set of questions. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So just to uh, give you a sense of where I'm headed here today, I'll say a bit about the scope of our study and certain of the basic definitions. I'll give a bit of a very brief history of the contested definition of lynching and how we've dealt with it um, in our work. Uh, say something a bit about what we know about Jim Crow uh, racial violence. Uh, I'll say a bit about policing in the, in the Jim Crow South and relate that to the Black Lives Movement uh, today. So a set of the basic definitions of what we look at in our uh, research, we look at racial violence in the South and violence equals deaths. We look at the South, the Confederate South, the 11 states of the Confederacy. Our time period is from 1930 to 1954. We stop with uh, 54, the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. And that's not because violence stopped in the South, but it's rather because violence after the 54 period might rightly be interpreted as reactions to then the civil rights mobilization. So while it was certainly violent, as we know, the, gym, uh, the uh, civil rights movement uh, with its uh, philosophy of nonviolence had to deal with a quite uh, violent reaction in the, in the region, uh, we choose 1930 to 1954 as the period when uh, there was uh, racial segregation by law and by custom in the South, uh, otherwise known as Jim Crow. Um, I should also say that while we're looking at racial violence uh, in the South, this is not to suggest that there was not racial violence around the rest of the country. Uh, not at all. But we are interested in, at the moment, trying to better understand 
uh, the Jim Crow period in the American South in particular. And we do that because there have been a lot of recent books out, most famously Michelle Alexander, really in a terrific book in which is titled The New Jim Crow. Um, and the argument is that we haven't quite gotten away from the old. And we agree with that uh, proposition when she talks about mass incarceration and the, the racial dimensions of the criminal justice system. But we thought we better understand the old Jim Crow. So part of our effort is to, to uh, give a much deeper and richer understanding of that period. Uh, so we look at, uh, we study what is term, the term lynching, and we've heard a lot about that. It's been used um, increasingly, and uh, uh, so, and it has a very particular uh, meaning. Uh, uh, it, uh, it means the definition of extra legal violence, uh, 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 and this was a definition that was, come up, that was created by the NAACP in 1940, and I'll get to a bit in a minute uh, the contested definitions of, of lynching. And uh, when the NAACP uh, put forward what they thought should be the definition of lynching, they said the following. They said, one, it had, they first had to be evidence that a person was actually killed. The second was that the person was killed illegally. And I put that in red um, because, uh, as you'll see, what that implied was that the police could not be charged with lynchings, with an with a, extra legal violence. So in other words, if a policeman was acting under cover of law, they weren't in fact involved in an illegal killing. Uh, that was a political decision in certain ways. So uh, in order for the, for the NAACP and nearly all black organizations who were concerned about lynching to try to get the police on their side, meaning part of how lynchings and those kinds of acts were uh, 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 enabled was by the lack of law enforcement, right? The notion that if a person was arrested and typically a, a, a black man was arrested for an alleged crime, and I'll talk a bit about what those crimes were, were uh, alleged, what it meant to be to commit a crime in the Jim Crow cell, uh, uh, they would be arrested and let's say uh, held by a sheriff. And a sheriff would say, uh, I have to, uh, I have to protect, ordinarily, when a person is arrested, they have to be protected by the sheriff, right? The notion is that they are, uh, they should expect due process. Uh, but typically what would happen was that a mob, right, would become the judge and the jury. They would go by the jail sometimes and overrun the sheriff, at least that's what the sheriff would say, right? I was overrun by, by the mob and so they took the prisoner. Or uh, the sheriff would say, I'm going to transfer this prisoner from this jail to another. And in transit, we were stopped by the mob and I lost control and such. So uh, uh, oftentimes law enforcement in either the uh, commission or omission of their duties were leading to uh, uh, deaths. So part of what many organizations wanted to happen was that the police to actually do their jobs. So it was a political, in certain ways, a, a, a strategically, but politically informed decision, understanding the circumstances in the ground in the South, that you were trying to get the, the police involved on your side, that is against extra legal killings. If you included them in the definition of lynching, it would seem to have been counterproductive. That may be useful from an organizational strategy when you are advocating for the ending of lynching. And I will remind you that the NAACP, when it first started in 1930, um, 1913 rather, for nearly, uh, from the beginning of the 20s all the way until the end of the 30s, their, one of their major legislative um, attempts but failures was to get an anti-lynching law passed at the federal level. And they, uh, they were arguing for a, a federal law against lynching precisely because of the inactivity of state authorities, that you could not rely on local authorities to prosecute murders. They thought that there needed to be a federal intervention, which is why there was an attempt to have a federal anti-lynching law. And you'll recall just last year, um, or actually earlier, uh, last year and the beginning of this year, there was an attempt um, uh, uh, put forward by now uh, uh, the uh, uh, vice, vice, presidential, vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris uh, to have a anti-lynching law uh, pass the U.S. Senate, and uh, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky is holding that up. Uh, the third uh, definition was that a group of three or more persons responsible for the death. So this is a notion of it being not necessarily a one-on-one, -on -one, but rather a group effort. And finally, uh, tied to number three, that the group acted under the pretext of the service to race, justice, or tradition, right? So 
what is missing there is act an actual crime, right? They're not acting because the person committed the crime, although, of course, we don't, we obviously don't want vigilante uh, 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 justice at all. Uh, but certainly, many of the groups that committed these uh, crimes would say that they were acting in, or at least under the pretext of protecting race, justice, or tradition. So I mentioned a bit uh, about the contested uh, definitions of lynching. Uh, and so in 1940, there were three main anti-lynching organizations in the US, the uh, NAACP, the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching, and the Tuskegee Institute had all themselves each year been collecting data about the number of lynchings in the Southern states. And there had been years of disagreement over the annual tally of lynchings that each group uh, or each uh, organization compiled. And of course, the differences of numbers was often used as, a, uh, as an argument against thinking about a lynching legislation or even whether this was a real phenomenon, right? So there's, are you all kind of making this up? Although that latter argument uh, carried little weight given the uh, brute reality of life in the South. And they came across in 1940, agreed upon a shared um, definition. Uh, and as I earlier mentioned, a definition which largely excluded killings that involved the police or officially deputized posses as perpetrators. Uh, uh, they also uh, eliminated killings where lynchings where the body was never recovered um, and lynchings that involved less than three perpetrators and lynchings, um, interestingly, that were connected to labor violence or political conflict. So here we have the distinction of whether uh, you had labor organizing going on in the South, and you did among certain of the sharecroppers and such, of uh, the populist movement and others connected in the 1930s, of course, to the rise of the communist movement, um, at least in certain parts of, uh, of the South, uh, principally Alabama, and also uh, just political conflict. For us, we, um, we uh, have largely hewed to this uh, uh, definition when we look at our uh, sources, but we do include police. We, uh, that's where we part um, from this definition. We understand why these associations, uh, looking back historically and studying uh, 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 what, they what they were up to, we understand why they chose the definition that they did at the moment. It made good political sense. Um, we are thinking about it more, obviously, as scholars, and we think it important to include the police. So uh, what do we know? So I'm thinking now as kind of a social scientist and looking at the exact um, uh, data that's out there. And uh, uh, there are three main sources that uh, nearly all social scientists use that they're looking at this kind of work. The first is a book that was published in uh, 1995, A Festival of Violence, by two sociologists, Beck and Tone. And they based their numbers on NAACP papers, the Tuskegee Institute, the Chicago Tribune, which during the 1920s and 30s kept the running tally of, of, of lynchings in the South. And they um, identify from those uh, records uh, uh, over 2,800 victims of lynch mobs, they were killed in 10 southern states. 2,500 of them were African American, and of the um, of the black victims, 94% uh, were murdered by white lynch mobs. So there's a very definite uh, racial divide between victims and perpetrators. They use five deep South states: Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina, as well as five border South states: Arkansas, Florida, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Tennessee. No doubt you've heard much about the Equal Justice Initiative led by uh, uh, Brian Stevenson and the uh, glorious uh, monument in um, Birmingham, uh, is it Montgomery, Alabama, rather, uh, the, the huge uh, new um, uh, museum and uh, monument, really, to uh, lynching victims. And um, in 2015, they released, released a re uh, report, Lynching in America, Confronting the Legacy of Racial Terror. They find a higher number than Beck and Tone. They look also at different years, 1877 to 1950. They look at 12 Southern states, the 11 con Confederate states plus Kentucky. Um, as I say, they found 700 more deaths than Beck and Tone, and they include more years. And unlike Beck and Tone, they include riots. We um, look more, our uh, collection method is much more like Beck and Tone, that is we don't include riots, we stick to the Confederate States. Um, and to date, we have, and we look at different years, we look at 1930 to 1954. So we start where Beck and Tone stop. 
Um, at the moment, we have 1,100 confirmed uh, deaths, and we've also found uh, 506 adverted lynchings. So I'll tell you a bit about how we know what we know. So as you notice, nearly all of the others uh, use uh, newspapers as a, begin as a starting point. And there's a reason for that. There are no, there are kind of no standardized or consistent data at all levels of government uh, about homicides, never minding racially motivated racially motive violence uh, uh, in, in particular. So the, uh, moreover, the racial markers of either the alleged perpetrators or the victims are is inconsistently collected. So there is no government database that we could easily go to. The FBI does not collect these data. They, they don't connect it. In, don't, they, they, didn't, they don't collect it now, and they, and they certainly didn't collect it back in the 1930s uh, and, and 40s and 50s. So we can't really look to government for that. Uh, so instead, scholars look to newspapers. So newspapers have effectively been the keepers of the public record. So here again, we should have a hearty cheer for the fourth estate, right? The need for a free and active uh, press. Uh, uh, and so that's what we start with. And that's what Beck and Tone use. That's also what the Stevenson uh, 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 project uses. And we start there too. What, it, what distinguishes us from the others is that while we begin with newspapers, we don't stop there. And I'll say a bit about our, um, our method. I should say that before, but before I get to that, though, that during the time period of our study, newspapers were segregated. So you have the major newspapers in the country, um, and then there were very important black newspapers. And uh, African American newspapers existed. There were some quite famous that were national, although they came out weekly, some of the most important being the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, the Baltimore Afro American, uh, the Norfolk uh, Journal. Uh, guide and journal out of out of Virginia, um, and then there were many local regional papers. They had an intense interest in um, in keeping up with this in a way that the major newspapers, national papers, did not. Which is not to say that the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the uh, Washington Post, the uh, Atlantic, uh, the uh, uh, Atlanta Constitutional uh, Constitution Journal did not study, uh, did not publicize uh, 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 lynchings, report on lynchings, but they did so if, um, if the lynching was particularly um, uh, uh, egregious or some major milestone had been reached in the number. In other words, they, it wasn't as much a part of their beat as it was for African-American newspapers. So African-American newspapers are absolutely essential in reconstructing this past that we would know far less were it not for them. I list here Ida B. Wells, uh, uh, who uh, was an African-American journalist uh, uh, who started her work in Memphis after the lynching of two of her friends who owned a very um, uh, successful uh, grocery store and um, were both lynched, uh, she argued, because of that success. Uh, and she wrote what is known as the Red Record. And uh, the red there is meant to, uh, to convey the blood uh, of, of lynching victims. And she wrote that in 1895. So we kind of see her as the mother of these efforts beginning um, in the late um, uh, 19th century. So we start uh, with the newspaper article. And I say we, I'm, I'm describing myself and uh, my uh, colleague, Margaret Burnham. And, uh, uh, and we give uh, a newspaper article, she gives the newspaper article to law students. And the first thing that they have to do is find a death certificate. And the death, so as, we, as the NAACP insists that we have to actually confirm that there was in fact a death. And the death certificate often gives us some clues. It will sometimes say uh, death at the, at, the, at the hands of a person's unknown. So that's one sense that this was probably a uh, mob uh, uh, death. Uh, but we don't stop there, obviously. Uh, the next thing that the student does is we uh, try to run down as best we can all of the documentary evidence connected to this murder, meaning are there any trial records? Are there any coroner's reports? Uh, did, the, did the NAACP get involved? And oftentimes they did. Uh, the NAACP would conduct their own investigation or when the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department was established in the early 40s, attempt to get the Department of Justice to send down, to work with the FBI to send down investigators. The FBI would send down investigators. They would sometimes take affidavits. Certain of those affidavits are available. We get them. 
All of this is done through a deep archival research. We have researchers working in Washington at the Library of Congress and the National Records. They submit FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Acts, and we get these materials. We in turn, the student in turn reaches out, reaches out to the family member. And uh, if we can find any living descendants, and oftentimes they are at least a generation or two removed, assuming we find those persons, the family members becomes the student's clients and the student then lawyers the case. So uh, we, uh, I'm running on time, so I want to uh, wrap up shortly. So I just want to say a bit about when we talk about policing in the Jim Crow South and much of the discussions about what we're, uh, 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 about our research deals with not only civilian violence, but also police violence um, and, and the connection between the two. And so I, I include this quote here. Uh, this was a quote that actually I, I also included in my um, op-ed in the Boston Globe um, from Gunnar uh, Gunner Myrdal, who wrote uh, really the magisterial and American dilemma, the Negro problem in modern democracy. And what makes it so important is that it was written in 1944. So it's contemporaneous to the, to the period that we're talking about. Um, and it says, and it, it identifies quite plainly the issue of, the, of violence and of the police in the American South, right? So the white policeman, and he's very clear on that, stands not only for civic order as defined in formal laws and regulations, but also for white supremacy in the whole set of social customs associated with this concept. And I have this in red for a reason. In the traditions of the region, a break of the caste rules against one person, that meaning white person, is conceived of as an aggression against white society and indeed as a potential threat to every other white individual. It is demanded that even minor transgress transgressions of caste etiquette should be punished, and the policeman is delegated to carry out this function. So if you have a system of Jim Crow, and if the system of Jim Crow uh, expects a certain amount of etiquette, right, quite aside from breaking a law, right, in etiquette, you are disrespectful to a white person. You don't take your hat off. You move too slowly. You talk back when you shouldn't. That could mean you're arrested. So, or Worse yet, if a white person takes offense and kills you, what's the problem, right? Uh, there were oftentimes uh, it's, uh, more cases than I care to count of these kinds of transgressions, which, which were effectively death sentences. So I ask you to think about th what I've just described and think a bit about our most recent cases. What were the basis of the deaths? Why did the police get involved in George Floyd? He supposedly was passing along a $20 bill. How does that end up in a death sentence? Right. So when people think, of, when we use the term uh, that we're, we're still dealing with Jim Crow justice, in my uh, way of thinking, that's exactly what the activists mean. So we come to today thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, reinvigorating a long overdue conversation, as far as I'm concerned, uh, deeply connecting the past to our present. And so, as I said, you know, there's a lot of talk about the 21st century, we're living in a new Jim Crow. And one of the start of the, of the Black Lives Movement, by way of conclusion, was the Mike Brown killing, uh, Michael Brown killing in, in 2014 in, in Ferguson, uh, uh, Missouri, where an unarmed 18-year-old uh, was killed by white police officer Darren Wilson. There were days of riot, as we all know, in, in Ferguson, and a response by a, military, a militarized police which in many ways deepened the crisis. A grand jury is impaneled. They do not indict the officer. The DOJ, then on the Obama administration with Eric Holder, investigates and in the end decides not to charge Wilson with violations of Brown's civil rights, concluding that Wilson was justified in his claim of self-defense. People may not have been satisfied with the investigation. That's neither here nor there in that regard, right? The point is that there was a process which was followed and the officer was given do uh, process. Typically what is asked is that also uh, others receive that same due process. But there are other things that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement besides uh, uh, the riots and such. The first was that the, the Black Lives Matter movement in a certain ways was inaugurated, right? It is certainly true that there was interest or concerns about police murders going back even to at least murders of, of unarmed uh, uh, black men, uh, young men actually, going back to before Michael uh, Brown, the most obvious being Trayvon Martin in Florida. But with the Ferguson, the Black Lives Movement comes alive. 
So concretely, we have the beginnings of a social movement. And as you all have probably uh, followed in the news, when the Black Lives Matter movement first started, right, its popularity was uh, quite racially divided. That is, it had much more support among African Americans, much less support by white Americans. Six years later, it's a quite a different story, uh, as the George Floyd uh, 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 killing uh, demonstrated, as well as what is now widely being described as our current racial reckoning. But in addition to the creation of the Black Lives Matter movement, we have a DOJ investigation of the Ferguson Police Department, which is something we're also discussing today, uh, different ways of thinking about uh, uh, policing. And what came of, out of that was an investigation which revealed a pattern of practice of unlawful conduct uh, by the Ferguson Police Department that violated the first, fourth, and 14th amendments to the US Constitution. And what it showed was that policing was basically connected deeply to revenue generation, right? So that is finding people for this and that, they get arrested, they can't pay, uh, they end up staying in jail longer because they can't pay the debt. So in other words, revenue generation was connected to, uh, uh, was a part of the excessive policing, or po excessive policing was done, in fact, to, to generate uh, revenue for the city. Uh, that may be, that's an important um, uh, finding, of course, but what makes it important is that what would it mean to be a Black citizen living in Ferguson, Missouri? It would a life in which you're constantly interacting with the state in order for there to be some infraction that carries some monetary penalty that you in turn have to pay bears no resemblance to living in a free society. And that's what the importance of that report showed. There is a notion what Black Lives Matter also means is a deepening appreciation of citizenship and what it means to move and be in the world without interacting with police in ways which in either it results in a fine or death. The Ferguson Police Department enters into the agreement with the Department of Justice to implement those reforms, which were carried on throughout the uh, under uh, 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 General Attorney uh, uh, Holder. Of course, when Jeff Sessions came into, uh, came into office in 2017, he immediately um, uh, terminated all consent agreements between the DOJ and police departments around the country regarding police reforms. And we also find, finally, increased electoral participation. Wesley Bell, who had been deeply involved in the Black Lives Movement, became part of the, uh, of the prosecutor for St. Louis County. And Ella Jones, the first African-American and the first woman who was elected Fergus, mayor of Ferguson in June of 2020. So I point that out to simply say a movement it also results in an investigation of the police department, which also results into greater participation in actual electoral politics. Uh, so with that, I think it's time for discussion. I think I've gone over my time a bit. I appreciate your indulgence and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Dean Nobles. Um, so we can now open up to questions. Um, just a reminder to our alumni viewers to ask questions today via the um, Q&A feature in Zoom and you can also upvote questions on there. Um, the first question comes from Joseph Levitch, and there's sort of general chatter on how to bring your research into understanding the modern day and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so this question asks, um, yesterday in Chicago, some of the Black Lives Matter leaders were quite vocal in their opinion that the recent looting in the city was justifiable reparation for years of racism that targeted Black people. How do you feel about that statement? That, uh, I had heard that. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't seem to me to make uh, much sense. It is certainly true that we have enormous uh, wealth inequality uh, between white and black Americans in, in, in particular, focusing on those two groups, which are deeply rooted in American history. And that requires a remedy, a, a deliberate policy-driven government-based remedy. It does not justify looting. Thank you, Dean Nobles. Um, 
Some of the other questions are um, looking at your historical analysis, and they're wondering um, if you broadened your analysis from beyond the Confederate states, um, what, if, that, if that would change what you have found. Well, I think it, it, would, it would certainly change it. I think it would show a couple of things. One, I, uh, uh, one it would show is that, you know, violence, uh, racial violence, either by police or citizens is a complicated matter, right? So I don't want to suggest that it's not, and it will likely be complicated in other parts of the country, have different historical roots as well as different organizational, um, you know, uh, 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 structures. I chose, we chose the period of the 19, uh, of, of Jim Crow and of the, uh, of, of the American South, as I earlier stated, precisely because we recognize there's a particular uh, history that we still don't well understand about Jim Crow itself. So in that part, it's quite uh, rooted in, uh, in, in, the, in the history of the region. But there are lessons to be learned because as people, you know, policing and how do we deal with racial animus in, uh, across the country is not limited to the South. And uh, so this is a, a, a point of, of study for other scholars. And there are lots of scholars who've written a bit about police brutality as it's the nomenclature that's often used to describe violence outside of the South in northern cities and in western cities. There's a tremendous amount of new research about that. So this is a quite a fruitful field. Um, we're limiting to our particular vineyard, but there's plenty to go around, and I look forward to younger scholars taking up just the kind of questions that you all are interested in. Thank you. Um, so the next question, I'm just sort of going to aggregate a few of them. A lot of people are wondering about um, how some of this research that you're doing can be brought into public school classrooms. Um, and, and what are the sort of obligations of educators to help start dismantling this legacy of systemic racism? Sure. So we've done um, a couple of things that is CRRJ. Um, for some years we had, we don't yet, we don't have it now, but we had uh, for the for uh, at least five years, a very direct connection with Cambridge Ridge and Latin, where we had, we gave uh, a, a class of students, they had to apply for it. And we worked with the social science, the social studies teachers in the school. We gave them uh, a newspaper article, much like we did our, much as we do our law students. And some of the law students helped tutor the students. And we basically gave them a case and said, work it out, figure out what happened here. And at the end result of, the, uh, of their studies was that they would go down to the South. We, we, we had a very generous uh, funder from a uh, private citizen in Cambridge who gave the money, who allowed us to send students along with law professors, law students, and their social studies teachers down to, uh, to a particular uh, site uh, where the uh, incident happened and uh, allow them to talk with current residents, see some of the archives, do that kind of research. And it was enormously helpful for many of these students who participated in it. it they said it shaped their interest in wanting to go to college. They better understood their own society. Some of these students, uh, the, the students themselves were quite varied in their backgrounds. Some of the parents were immigrants, some Americans, all of the, a, a total mix of experiences. So all of them were getting a deeper, more complex, nuanced understanding of American history. So we think it's really important. Um, and, and our hope is that we can find ways to encourage teachers to include just a module or two, right? So if you're thinking about uh, 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 American history, so first, we, we wouldn't describe it as, you know, kind of like Black history. We'd say this is American history. We study uh, we study slavery. It was an important part of American history, right? While it happened, obviously, in the South, the, the entire country's economy was based on it. Its government was organized around it. It ends with new Civil War amendments after, you know, changes to constitutional order. So these are pretty important milestones. We get to the 20th century, we talk about segregation. We barely talk about it. We talk about uh, Rosa Parks, who was angry about having to sit on a segregated bus without describing the deepness of segregation in the South by law and custom, and in the North by custom, if not by law. We kind of gloss over that. We get to Martin Luther King. Then we get to Barack Obama, election of a black president. So we have to more deeply complicate our history along that dimension, which deals with African-Americans and 
and as I said, all Americans, right, by virtue of being in the U.S., as well as the experiences of many other groups. We have a gloriously diverse country. It's complex, as is its history, and we do ourselves no favors when we simplify it. Thank you so much for that. Um, next question goes back into your research. This is from Eric Devereaux. Um, I'm sort of going to add my own little um, question to it. Sure. And he was wondering when the law students um, find a client, basically, what is their goal? Um, you know, what do they try to achieve for the family? And I'm just wondering, as a journalist myself, how you can put this in the context of a story, like a, a you know, a client that you have managed to help. Sure. So, um, uh, one family uh, uh, that we helped, um, uh, well, let me say generally what, what we uh, intended to do. Uh, one is a pedagogical uh, reason for the students. They have to know how, they, they are learning how to be a lawyer in a way, right? And part of that means kind of understanding a client and working with a client. That's one basic part of it. But the more important part of it is for, for the student and for the family. For the families, it's oftentimes uh, a revelation. That is, they may have known a bit about what happened to grandma, because there are many mothers in this and grandmothers, or grandpa or uncles and such, but this, the family did not fully know the story. They are often surprised, for example, when we come with them, come to them with the papers from the NAACP, uh, uh, the FBI, that actually investigated the murders, right? The family sometimes didn't even know that those documents existed. So for many families, it is a kind of putting together the pieces. One family uh, that uh, we helped out uh, 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 the, the, was a grandmother who, who, was, uh, who was killed. And um, uh, when we told uh, her, when we told her descendants, they all said uh, the descendants were this woman's sons. And so they thought, now I better understand my father's reactions to certain things. Like they had never fully understood because many of the direct descendants uh, to the to the murdered person um, uh, were traumatized and sometimes uh, wanted not to burden their their own children with knowledge, the half knowledge that they sometimes had about that particular uh, 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 incident. So in many families, it closes a hole, right? It 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 gives explanation to to um, uh, to their to their experience, and um, and they find it as I said often revelatory. It is not always easy. Some families find it quite difficult to kind of process the information in a way that is uncomplicated, as you would expect. Um, and there is a bit of wanting to keep it quiet. So I'm not going to talk too much about specific cases, in part because we do get a reaction that while it is a public story in the sense that. Uh, people are killed. Um, in the end, they feel it's my uncle. It was my great uncle. It was my um, uh, uh, great grandmother, great grandfather. And um, so there's a certain amount of wanting to also be private about it. Um, uh, I encourage you, though, to go to our, uh, to the website of CRRJ. We do have some cases, I think, that are public. We don't keep all of our cases. We haven't revealed all of them. And some, we do have families who are quite active. They uh, have become friends of the of the program. They um, keep in touch with us. Uh, we've been invited to family reunions. I mean, so it has, each family deals with it differently, which is completely understandable given the nature of what we're looking at. Thank you. Sort of related to that, some people are asking about reparations. Has there been any move in these cases or even more broadly, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that push for reparations for members of the African American community in the United States? So we we've, we've, we think a quite a lot about it in quite cr uh, concrete ways, although I can't say that we've come up um, uh, I think we would more think about it as our cases help to build a a, a building block for a larger national discussion about reparations, as was begun a bit in the, uh, at least among certain of the Democratic uh, candidates um, in the primary. Um, most of our cases include some loss of something beyond life. It often includes property. Certain of our victims were wealthy, or at least had much by the standards of the day, and certainly had more than most of their white neighbors thought they should have. Uh, and, uh, and that is a big part of many of our cases, not all, but many. 
And um, we do, and the family members themselves, those who we get in contact with, are themselves quite concerned about that because they feel that their inheritance was literally robbed from them. So we think um, that uh, at the very least, what our research can do is one uh, arm the uh, family members with greater knowledge of the circumstances of their own families I earlier described, and secondly, begin to put together a case. Let's make the argument, right? If we think about it as a legal case, here's the evidence for why we think a serious discussion about reparations is appropriate uh, and, uh, and um, put it on the uh, public uh, agenda. In the end, uh, I'm not sure what our country will do, but I do think there has to be a discussion about if we're going to deal with the deep-seated inequality, um, much of which is the result of the incidents of which I'm describing as well as much larger government policies, there has to be a governmental effort. And that has to be based on evidence and the experiences of real Americans. And we are gathering that data. So uh, I think that's where we are now with it. And we are in conversation. The fact that we're having a conference in the fall uh, with certain direct descendants of our project um, uh, families who are interested in talking about reparations. So I'll have more to say about that in the months and years to come. Oh, well, very excited to hear about that. Um, one of the questions uh, from Ron Hot and some, I'm sorry, I might have mispronounced that, and some others um, has to do with what white allies can do to help in this moment in time. Well, I think there are a lot of things that white allies can do. One of the best things, one of the first things and is uh, education, educating themselves. Uh, it's important. There's a lot about our country that we don't know. We, you know, the U.S. is no different than the countries around the world. We all have our national myths. Uh, and one of the myths in our country has been uh, that somehow the racism, it was, it was there, of course we had it, but may not have been as bad, or this wasn't, uh, uh, you know, racism can't explain everything, which is true, obviously it cannot. But the depth of what has happened in the US, I don't think is well appreciated. And um, so white allies learning more, right? Uh, one um, that, that I have to say is when I, when Margaret and I travel around the South and we, we go to the region quite a bit as you would expect because we, um, uh, there are many people in the South who are interested in what we do, both black and white. But many of our audiences are often all black. And we often say, and we have a few white people in the audience, some of whom have looked in their own family histories and have found an uncle or an aunt who was either a member of the Klan or was a former cop who had been involved in some kind of killing or they knew of something, something that they knew about. They have a personal and direct, often a familial interest. Um, and one woman who came to one of our talks uh, down in New Orleans, which we were about two years ago, said uh, in speaking to other white people in the audience, we have to do a better job of desegregating our lives. So that's the challenge for white allies. Have more, have real integrated lives. Just have lives in which you're dealing with lots of different people. African Americans and people of color often do that by nature. We have to do that. We are a minority, right? Our lives in many ways means that, but we're not immune from that um, admission either, right? We all have to make an effort to better integrate our lives and to better understand the experiences, the historical experiences of others, and to listen intently. That's one first thing that white allies can do. The second they can do is now after you talk to all the people of color, talk to your friends and your families. It can't be conversations where you hear them saying things and you don't correct them. Now I'm not saying argue with your folks, and 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 and, uh, and get into too many fights, but I do think that spirited discussions, we all own this. This isn't black people. We weren't lynching ourselves. There has to be some ownership of this. And part of that ownership means engaging other people, other white people on your own terms, in your own spaces, in integrated spaces, whatever spaces you wanna do them. It is not optional. This won't change if people don't make those kinds of intentional efforts. And there are lots of ways to do it. And I'm sure that we have a creative group of people who are listening. And I'm sure you'll come up with some. 
Um, sort of related to that is a question from Robert Monroe, um, and I think we could probably even extend it beyond education, which we talked a little bit about, but um, children are already attending um, pretty segregated schools by race and class in this country, and related to that, we also live in sort of these racial enclaves for the most part. And how can we go about this sort of integration when we are sort of geographically separated both within our schools and our communities? Now that's a great question. It's something, and I, I won't have an easy answer to that. I do think I, I, I sometimes take solace in the younger generation um, where uh, at least on certain circumstances, culturally, maybe it's through social media, which has this really kind of interesting and oftentimes contradictory at least um, uh, tension, which on the one hand you see uh, social media can be quite siloy, right? You get into one particular kind of effort and you don't break out. But on the other hand, it also is quite an expansive media, which allows people to connect. So it has these uh, kind of internal uh, tensions. Um, uh, uh, but I do think that um, uh, perhaps we could we should think about uh, kind of civic organizations. Oftentimes, the arts do a good part of breaking around barriers and bringing people together in ways that aren't connected to residents. I mean, if you live in a particular res, uh, 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 we all do live in kind of these pockets. If there are kind of uh, different reasons to bring us together to get us out of our silos it is quite complicated and i don't have an easy i don't have an easy answer the other is to kind of deal with school segregation right and to find ways to honestly put together an educational system which breaks down these barriers which doesn't and to deal with residential segregation i mean those two things right which are both directed directly connected to american history and public policy right um, our president at the moment let us know that, right? He said, I'm telling, you know, the Obama administration put something in order about trying to make affordable housing uh, easier, I imagine, in, in suburbs. And the, our current president says, you know, I'm getting rid of that, right? He recognizes whatever the, the, uh, the motivations for his uh, announcement, he recognizes the role of government and policy in directing behaviors. So there's still a role to play by the government in helping us think about segregation in education, and there's still a role the government can play in helping us think about residential segregation. I won't give up on those two things, since the fact of the matter is that where we live and where we go to school are really important parts of our lives. And there may be lots of reasons why people choose the reasons where they go. If we had better distribution of resources and better quality of education across the board, that may get at certain of these issues. Thank you so much. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, so I'm aggregating a couple of them. People have some follow-up questions on the reparations discussion. Sure. Uh, Clara Bro, for instance, is wondering what are smaller ways that reparations type um, policies can be rolled out? Um, and then Lou Metzger also wants to know if there's research showing um, sort of what forms of reparation, sort of broadening the definition are, have been shown to be most effective. Sure. Uh, so two points, I'll take that last point uh, first. Uh, there was a really great uh, article in the Washington Post about James Clyburn in South Carolina and a, uh, his work on, on the congressional level as well as on the state level in putting together uh, policies that were quite local uh, but were intended to deal with inequality uh, in a way that reparations also in, uh, is uh, thought of, is desired uh, that it do. And uh, so I think the efforts can be, quite, uh, can be quite local. That is working in cities, working in counties, working in, uh, in states, rather than thinking about a, a national effort. So the city of Chicago has, has passed some um, uh, interest in, uh, in, in doing uh, some kind of reparations. I'm not sure of the exact uh, uh, nature of it. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina recently committed itself to reparations and there they define it as being quite explicit about supporting black businesses, thinking about supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, how do we boost um, home ownership? So looking forward for the 21st century. So if the notion of reparations is about dealing with ingrained um, inequality, economic and, uh, and, and at least at this point, economic and perhaps social inequality. Uh, the way a, a possible corrective could, uh, looking forward would be, okay, how do we build wealth today? How can we better uh, distribute uh, 
uh, public resources? How can we ensure that all citizens have a shot? Uh, if we think about uh, uh, reparations that way, it seems to me to be a perhaps more politically palatable and also uh, politically feasible. And if we think about it happening at a local level as opposed to the national, that may also be it. So I would say to you, uh, if you're in a city, uh, and I uh, would look at the state, uh, you know, look at your city council, get a sense of how it's organized, who may be interested in pushing reparations, getting involved with local organizations. I say start local. Um, local national stories are at bottom local stories. Thank you so much. Um, well, I will ask one last question. Sure. Um, what can the, so your research focuses on um, the world of newspaper. It starts with newspapers and, and finding the lynching stories in a lot of the press. And of course, the media itself has a long history of segregation. And I'm just wondering, given the sort of fallout happening within the media as well, what journalists should be doing to cover these movements? Is there something that you see sort of that's, that's wrong and how these movements are being covered and how to sort of begin integrating the various forms of media so that all voices can be heard? Sure. I think the media um, is doing a pretty good job. I, I, li uh, so let me say what I think, what I, what I like about it. And, I'm, and, and, and it will certainly show my East Coast bias, right? I mean, I read a lot of the Washington Post and, um, and of the uh, New York Times. And so I don't have a good read of, for example, what the, uh, what the uh, newspapers of, of Chicago are doing or Los Angeles or, or Atlanta even. Um, but taking the Washington Post as, as an example, uh, you know, they have now this notion kind of race and reckoning and they have every day some stories connected to this. So while the news cycle has moved on uh, in certain ways, we obviously we're dealing with this uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic. We're dealing with now uh, a, a presidential election. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, international issues and such. There's still, uh, we're in an incredibly busy news cycle, but they've managed, even though the, you know, the calls for reforms um, may not be quite as loud in the streets, although they are in certain streets, uh, they're still continuing with the, re with, the, with the coverage, right? Kind of keeping up the stories, trying to find connections. They have one part that deals specifically, they usually on weekends, that deals with the history, right? So they are purposely thinking about all their cases. And, all, and in their reports, they've included two uh, cases from our project, as, 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 as a matter of fact. And I'm happy to send along the links about that, uh, uh, about our, our work. So I think they're doing um, a terrific job. I think the press uh, uh, has a, you know, it's a difficult responsibility. It's in, in the sense you, you know, I'm, if they play it straight, just tell the story of what's happening and, 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 and at the same time, try to provide a context for what it is that the, that the, uh, that the uh, protesters are demanding, as well as all, uh, from the police point of view, politicians, give us as full a view as possible, because in the end, this is a societal issue and all uh, stakeholders uh, must be uh, involved. Um, you know, I think there's a big role for the for the public. You know, in, the, in effect, with smartphones and such, we, in a way, um, have a certain amount of 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 of, uh, of uh, citizen journalists. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I want to call attention. By that, I mean I want to call attention to the young woman at George Floyd, uh, the woman, the young 16-year-old young girl who held her video for nine or ten minutes, steady, knew not to move it knew that she was, in a way, a journalist, an active citizen, uh, you know, uh, uh, helping us better understand. Had, make no mistake about it, had she not had that video, we might not have heard about George Floyd. That is the truth of the matter. And so I give a lot of credit to technology. I give a lot of credit to Black Lives Matter for getting younger people to think about, hey, use your technology, you, there's something looks wrong, you, you know, record it. If, you know, if, if that had been a correct uh, arrest, then that would have been a video that she could have deleted. Uh, and uh, getting people, uh, you know, kind of contributing to this collective uh, knowledge. In the end, we do have to adjudicate, of course, and that's why we have courts, that's why we have trained journalists. It's one thing for people to think that they can tell the stories, another thing to be a trained journalist. So I'm not at all suggesting that anyone can be a journalist. There's a very particular role that journalists have to play, and I'm a strong supporter of the Fourth Amendment, especially in a democracy. Uh, and um, 
of, of, of the uh, fourth state um, in our democracy. And, um, and they're proving their worth uh, today, even with all of the uh, uh, assaults that go against the press. Uh, that just means that you're doing your jobs. Thank you so much. Um, so that wraps up the question and answer portion for now. Um, on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you for tuning into this MIT Forum for Equity Broadcast. And thanks to Dean Melissa Nobles for joining us today. Um, a special note, this is the first of many events under this title to be convened by the MIT Alumni Association. If you have ideas for topics or speakers in this series or other feedback, please reach out to alumnilearn at mit.edu. Alumni will be sure to forward all questions asked via the Q&A to our speaker today, and alumni office staff will keep the chat window open for networking um, for another 15 minutes or so. A reminder that this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.